Hey folks, talking about another tutorial problem. This one is uh, not from the book, but it's uh, titled Collision with a Rotating Rod. So consider a rotating rod of mass 500 grams. It rotates about the center of mass uh, on a fixed axle, and it's rotating at 120 radians per second. As the rod becomes vertically aligned, two small one kilogram masses of clay strike it sticking to it. The clay masses move at 10 meters per second parallel to the x-axis. The clay masses strike the rod at the tips of the rod. Note it with an x in the figure. So we're talking about right here and right here, right as the rod has fully kind of come into this position. I know that was really messy, so I'm going to erase all of that. Um, while the rod is perfectly aligned in the y-axis. All right. So that's what we have going on. We're not considering gravity here. We're considering a very um, a floaty kind of system. Um, I probably should have put that in the uh, in the problem. If you're ever confused or wondering whether or not we should be thinking about um, the effects of gravity, just look ask ask a question um, what's the moment of inertia of the rod so this is a lookup right we know that it's going through uh, the axle uh, is going through the center of mass uh, of the rod so we can look that up and if we do we find that I of the rod is equal to 1 12th ml squared if you watched my other uh, explanation video um, you may have heard me talk about this L swapping. Where did the R go? Normally we're talking about MR squared. Well, L and R, they're both distances. Um, and really what we're trying to, to capture with this moment of inertia equation is the characteristic length scale or distance of our object. In the case of spheres and disks and things like that, we're talking about um, radii. Right? That's the defining characteristic length scale. When we're talking about rods or sheets or, or something like that, then it's going to be some sort of you know L, some sort of total length or side length or something like that. Um, so it's really, it, it's the same thing. We're just giving it a different um, letter to, to signify it. Um, because it makes more sense maybe to talk about L for a rod, the length of a rod, rather than the radius of a very thin rod. We're saying that it essentially has no inner radius, and the radius of the... It, it just gets confusing, right, to think about it that way. So uh, let's keep moving. We have 1 uh, 12th of 0 0.5 kilograms, and it's 2 meters long, so we have 2 meters squared. When we plug this into our calculator, I get 0 0.167 kilogram meters squared. So that's the moment of inertia of the rod. Again, it does not matter that it is rotating or not rotating uh, when we're looking at this. Um, the moment of inertia uh, is just based on the shape and the axle. Where, where are we pivoting around? Where is the axle going through? What is the initial rotational kinetic energy of the spinning rod? So Ke translational is 1 half mv squared. If we think about rotational uh, quantities now, I have 1 half not m but i, not v but omega squared. So if I plug that in, I have 1 half times 0 0.167 kilogram meters squared times 120 radians per second squared. When I find how many joules that is, I get 1202.4 joules. So that's my rotational kinetic energy. What's the initial angular momentum of the spinning rod? Which direction does the angular momentum uh, vector point in? So angular momentum, right, is going to be our I omega. Um, I'm not actually going to put the, the vectors on here just yet. It doesn't quite make sense to use the R cross P um, in this case uh, because I have uh, 
all these these minuscule amounts of mass starting to rotate. So I'd actually have to take an integral of the r cross p. Um, rather, let's talk about i omega, which is equivalent, which is equivalent in this case. Um, I'm going to say that it's uh, 0 0.167 kilogram meters squared times 120 radians per second. That gives me 20. 20 uh, kilogram meters squared per second. That's my angular momentum. Now, let's think about whether this is quote unquote positive or negative. Um, if we're thinking about the normal conventions, right, counterclockwise is positive, clockwise is negative. So are we rotating in a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion? Moving counterclockwise, so this is a positive um, angular momentum. A positive angular momentum. Um, so if we wrap our fingers around in a counterclockwise direction, my thumb actually points out of the page. And that thumb pointing out of the page indicates the direction of the angular momentum. L vector points out of the page or the screen if you're just watching this, right? But it points in the positive Z direction, right? All right. Right as the clay masses reach the tips of the spinning rod, what are their individual angular momenta? What is the direction of their momentum vectors? So here is a perfect, uh, a perfect situation in which we want to say that we don't have an I or a formal I in this case, right? We're not uh, on a rigid body yet rotating around this, this thing. So really, I need to be thinking R cross P. And that makes sense because my, my uh, clay objects are actually just moving in a linear fashion. But that linear momentum can be converted into an angular momentum, as we're about to find out. So really this is, I need to make sure I have my vectors here. Um, we're going to play it fast and loose though with those vectors. Uh, we're going to figure out the directions afterwards. Um, instead, we're just going to talk about the magnitudes of these things. So I'm going to talk about magnitude of R times the magnitude of uh, P of our linear momentum, or MV. And then I'm going to multiply it by a sine of the angle between them. So if I think about what's going on here, right, I'm going to draw an overlapping <laughs> figure right now. I have clay coming in, hitting uh, the top of this rod. I'm rotating about the center. I know that I'm some r away. <clears throat> this r is going to be one meter. I know that I'm moving at 10 meters per second, right? So my r vector extends up here. My p vector goes like this. The angle between them is 90 degrees. So if I start to go through this, I can say that I have one meter times my mass, which is one kilogram, times 10 meters per second, times sine of 90, which we already know is one. Uh, what do I get? I get 10 meter, sorry, 10, let's get the units right, 10 kilogram meters squared per second. Now the last thing we need to do is think about the direction of these angular uh, momentum vectors. If we think about this, uh, <clears throat> this cross product, I have R pointing up, and then I bend my fingers in the P direction. Right? So I put my fingers up, I bend the, my fingers to the right, and I see that my thumb is pointing into the page. Right? It's pointing into the page. Into page, right, is my vector. That's negative, right? When I think about this, that into the page is the negative z direction. <clears throat> it's a negative angular momentum. So I really need to, to remind ourselves of that, right? That it's 
negative. It's going to come up a little bit later. And that's, of course, for each of the uh, angular momenta of these clay things, these clay masses. After the collision, when the clay masses are stuck to the rod, what's the new moment of inertia of the system? And we can always um, add moments of inertia, much like we could add masses in a system. If we're thinking about a two-block mass system on an incline, a lot of times, you know, say for, for the, the past exam, we, <clears throat> we said that those things could be thought of as one system with the masses just, just added up. Well, the total uh, moment of inertia can be thought of the sum of all the individual moments of inertia. So moment of inertia for the rod plus 2 times the moment of inertia for my clay masses. Now, since these clay masses are really just point particles rotating about, um, about an axle, this is simply just mr squared, straight up. So I have 1 half uh, 0 0.5 kilograms times 2, sorry, 1 12th, not 1 half, 1 12th, 0.5 kilograms, 2 meters squared plus... 2 times uh, 1 kilogram times 1 meter squared. And there are two of these clay masses, so we multiply that by 2. What do we get? I get a moment of inertia equal to 2.167 kilogram meters squared per second. No kilogram meters squared. These units are rough, so be careful. Think about what you're plugging into them. What's the total uh, initial angular momentum of the system? Right. So we have the angular momentum of the rod and the angular momentum of the two masses right before the collision. So right before the collision. All right, so I initial total is equal to I of the rod plus I of uh, the clay times 2, right? Because there are going to be two. Uh, no, sorry. Why am I thinking about I? My mind is on angular, uh, is on, on moment of inertia, not on angular momentum. L, there we go. L uh, initial total is equal to L of the rod plus L of the clay masses times 2. And if I think about that, I have positive 20 kilogram meters uh, squared per second minus 10 kilogram meters squared per second times 2. Right. Each of our clay masses um, are going into the page right, with their angular momenta. Uh, that means that they're negative, and I had initially positive 20 kilogram meters squared per second. So when I add this all up, I get zero. Huh, I get zero. The initial total angular momentum of the system is zero. And when the collision actually happens, there's no wall involved. There's no complex external system. Angular momentum is conserved, right? This is an isolated system. Delta L is equal to zero. So what's the total final angular momentum of the system? LF equals LI equals zero. There's no angular momentum before or after when I consider not only the rotating rod, but also the uh, two clay masses. So what's the final angular velocity of the system right after the collision, right? Final equals I omega. Well, if LF equals zero, omega has to equal zero. These clay masses have stopped the rotating rod in its tracks. It has completely negated all of the rotation 
and so it, it the, the system has come to a halt. So omega equals zero, which is a little bit anticlimactic. <laughs> if if it wasn't perfectly equal to each other, we would still have some final momentum because we would have had some initial momentum, right? And then we would have found how changing the i at the end, right, having our new i total would have changed my uh, angular velocity. Um, maybe I'll try and put together a, another problem showing uh, showing that off a little bit more, maybe for next week. Um, but if you have any questions with this one, uh, shoot me an email or come into an office hour. But that was a collision with a rotating rod tutorial problem. Have a good one, and I'll see you for the next video.